Good morning, everyone. It is now 10 a.m. Central European time. And uh, we will start this webinar. Um, so good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us in this webinar from Inspire Europe. This Zoom meeting is in the webinar form uh, and the cameras and microphones of the participants will therefore be turned off with the exception of the panelists. And we'll get back to some housekeeping rules in a short while. So the focus of this webinar is on how host organizations can best support researchers at risk to make the most out of their stay at the hosting institution with a specific focus on the needs and the challenges and the future career steps. My name is Karina Catoni and I will be facilitating today's webinar. I'm working at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden and we are one of the partner organizations in the Inspire Europe project. I have personal experience in the hosting of research at risk within my university and I'm also coordinating the Swedish section of the Scholars at Risk Network with 21 higher education institutions. So before introducing you to our eminent speakers, uh, I will give you a short overview of the Inspire Europe project. So the Inspire Europe project is an initiative to support, promote and integrate research at risk in Europe and is funded by the European Commission's Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions. The project runs until August 31st, 2022 and has 10 partner organizations. The coordination is done by Scholars at Risk Europe, hosted at Maynooth University Ireland. And you, you see their website here below, so maynoothuniversity.ie slash SAR Europe slash Inspire Europe. I also wanted to tell you something about the objectives of the Inspire Europe. The objectives of the Inspire Europe is to uh, lay a groundwork for a long-term and cross-sectoral European support structure for research at risk, and also to contribute to informed policymaking in Europe. It has also a focus of bridging the gaps between existing national and European support mechanisms, and also between the academic and non-academic sector. Another focus is to improve the career development opportunities for researchers at risk. And the preparation of the work environment to host, fund and employ researchers at risk is also uh, one of the goals. And the preparation of the work environment is also the focus for the webinar today. Uh, and we will arrange further webinars in this field. So please check the Maynooth University website, the Inspire link that I mentioned previously for more information. And there are also previous webinars on this topic that you could have a look at. And the, the last point for or aim for Inspire Europe is to grow the diversity of actors supporting researchers at risk. I wanted to say something um, about the housekeeping rules. And this webinar is being recorded and it will be available afterwards. And the chat function for attendees is disabled, so questions can be used can be raised using the Q and A button that you see in the bottom of your square, in of your screen. And if you don't wish to for your name to be seen, please click submit question anonymously before sending. And after webinar, we will ask you to uh, fill in a short survey um, about this webinar. And by this, I would like to introduce you to our speakers. We have today with us three researchers at risk with the experience from being hosted at higher education institutions, and also one of them have transitioned to the private sector. And we also have one speaker uh, giving the hosting perspective from the university. So our first speaker is Ekbel Doken, a researcher at the Department of Nutrition at the University of Oslo in Norway. Welcome, Ekbel. And then we have Suad Ode, who is an IT technical advisor at FI Group in France. Welcome to you as well, Suad. And then our third speaker will be Ahmed Gurata, a senior visiting scholar from Stockholm University Institute for Turkish Studies in Sweden. Welcome, Ahmed. And then our last speaker will be uh, Marit Egner, who is the senior advisor in the Office for Research and International Cooperation at the University of Oslo in Norway. Welcome to you as well, Marit. So the speakers will have uh, eight minutes each, and after that we will have a panel discussion. So I would also like to remind you to ask a question to the panel by using the Q&A function. And by this, I will leave uh, the word uh, and screen to Ekpal. Thank you so much, uh, Carolina. Just let me to share my screen with my PowerPoint. Yeah.
Yes. So today I'm going to talk or share my experience with the university or university hosting experience. Uh, it will be include um, my experience uh, with life and working in uh, a new social, culture and um, working environment or academic environment in several or different um, universities. Um, so uh, I would like to start uh, that um, I received my PhD and postdoc from uh, UKM, University of Kamiksa Malaysia in Malaysia. Uh, I spent several years there before the war and then I returned to Yemen in this date, July 2013. Um, everything was positive since I arrived in Yemen, like um, receive a position from the first of, um, from the first week. Uh, receive uh, a civil foundation award uh, after two months, um, establish new department. It was one of my dreams. I bring it with me from Malaysia, um, start to do some collaboration with different um, universities around uh, the world, especially Malaysia. So um, it was really positive. Uh, everything was positive and I can see that. Um, all my academic achievement was um, or increased day by day, but um, unfortunately everything um, gone by this date, 26 uh, March 2015. This date, the war started in my city um, because the war already uh, started in um, uh, Sana'a, capital city of Yemen, but this date was in Taiz, my city. So everything done, what I have done before, it was really difficult period to stay just uh, um, at home without anything. And we uh, had to run away from our area because it's become so uh, dangerous. Um, uh, our own home bombed. I lost several of my family members, um, staff, students, friends, uh, stay at home or rental apartment. Um, uh, all the time, stress, cared because bombed around us. Um, no electricity, no internet, no clean water, um, no safe place. So it was difficult, but um, I was lucky that um, a scholar Rescue Fund helped me to um, go out from Yemen before Sana'a airport bombed or closed. So the first uh, university uh, they hosting me was uh, University of Malaysia in Malaysia. In Malaysia, I spent two years there, and then I moved uh, after that um, through SAR School Rescue Fund to Norway um, University of Agder. I spent two years and a few months, three months, and then I moved. Uh, to Oslo through SAR University of Oslo. So three uh, universities. Uh, and I can say that the best way, best ways that host universities and employers can facilitate career development for the researchers at risk who are hosted or employed by, first of all, contact person and mentor to help support advice, guidelines, assist, and give more information about the host institute or university and host country. Really contact person is very, our mentor are very important, important to um, uh, make the scholar at risk understand very well the academic culture and work environment. For, for me, it was the most important when I moved from uh, Malaysia or from my country to Europe. It's very, everything was uh, different. So it's very important for us to have contact person um, and mentor. And at the same time, the universities or host universities should, especially in Europe, they should support the scholar at risk to learn the language. As you know that the language in Europe countries is very important. So even with courses within the universities or in the school outside. So also very important to have specific courses um, um, for anything in their field or to understand and adapt in the host uh, university or host country. So uh, the most important choices I uh, and opportunities in my career, um, I can say that um, uh, develop 
during my time in the host universities, facilitate or facilities and support to continue my network activities. This is the most important I started with. And I, I received very good uh, advice from my contact person around me uh, and mentor colleagues that just keep uh, continue your um, network uh, activities. And this is very important when you start with new uh, academic culture, you should work on yourself uh, to adapt uh, with this new new um, uh, environment and at the same time we don't want um, to also um, waste our time just to adapt we should keep our uh, ac activities with the network so at the same time I was really surrounded with or by amazing people here in Europe also in Malaysia but I'm focusing about um, my time uh, in Europe because everything was different. In Malaysia, I was familiar for everything because I was there before, but I was really supported with many things um, uh, in my academic uh, journey when I was there. So um, people around me was uh, were very important to encourage me um, to just keep working on myself, to adapt, uh, to continue my academic or my network activities. And this is very important if you have very good people around you, colleagues, friends, uh, mentor, contact person, it's good to uh, adapt and integrate in a new culture and a new um, academic environment. So at the same time, Financial uh, support was very important. I received from the universities. Uh, um, I was uh, like in the University of Agdar. I uh, studied uh, the language in the university. They have uh, different courses and in the school, school, it was also supporting by the university. And now I'm studying uh, the language within the University of Oslo and in the school and it was uh, and it is also supported by um, uh, the university uh, so it's very important especially in Europe uh, this is what I like it what I had or see uh, already um, I took it working with Norwegian course is very important um, I like it that I learned many things in this course how can I um, work with Norwegian people so this is, I can say, the result of my um, journey during my uh, different um, uh, universities. So you can see here, this after my academic or after my network activities, I attended different or several several um, events around the world, and I became a member in TWAS, a member with a Global Young Academy. Uh, I started or uh, I received um, many invitation to teach in the department or in another department, join research center, give my talk about my experience. And in the end of 2018, um, they selected me University of Agdar uh, as um, um, I can see uh, a good employed in the university. And in 2019, I received this prize uh, um, Culture Builder uh, Award for 2019 for the University of Agdar. So now I'm working with the University of Oslo. I'm, I'm now still working in my language. At the same time, I'm working on a project to be a supervisor for several uh, master students soon in spring. So um, good people, mentor, contact person, support from the host university is very important for us to be a success again after what we faced in our uh, academic journey uh, after the war. So thank you. This is what I just want to share with you. Thank you very much, Iqbal. Thank you for both sharing your background and your journey and also for giving us concrete examples on what is important for the host organizations to, to work on while hosting a research is at risk. And I just want to remind you that we will, uh, you will have to either uh, put your questions in the Q&A function already now or wait with them until we have the panel discussion. But I would advise you to put them, if you have any specific questions to ECPOL, uh, please put them in the ECPOL. Thank you again, ECPOL.
Okay, so I will now uh, introduce you to Suad. Suad, please turn on your camera and um, the floor is yours. And the microphone as well, Suad, please. Uh, I'm Suad Ode. Uh, I'm uh, an IT technical advisor at uh, IFI uh, Group, an international uh, society uh, specialized in management of innovation. And I'd like to introduce today, to talk to you today about, uh, to introduce some ideas on how host institutions can help school, schoolers at risk uh, uh, integrating um, uh, private sectors. Uh, but first of all, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Syrian, a refugee in France since 2015. Uh, I worked as associated professor in um, uh, Damascus University in Syria, uh, in uh, Dejla University College in Iraq, and uh, at Université Claude Bernard de Lyon 1 uh, in France. Uh, my research concerns uh, the economics of metadata, and, uh, which are uh, tools and services um, uh, that help uh, organizing digital information. I was, um, I obtained in 2018 a fellowship uh, of, uh, from POSE, POSE uh, the, the French national program to help scholars uh, at risk in France. It's the equivalent of SAR uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, at, uh, at the end of it, I, I worked for a French institution for uh, uh, four years. Uh, from 2015 uh, uh, till 2018, but I decide at the end of um, uh, Paul's fellowship uh, to leave academia. Uh, because, in fact, this decision was very difficult to me, but it was uh, very difficult to stay uh, uh, in the academic uh, environment in France. In, in fact, uh, um, uh, in France, um, uh, there are a uh, uh, few uh, post uh, academic post uh, positions offered at a national level and uh, uh, too many candidates competing uh, to get this position uh, uh, and I wanted a permanent and a stable uh, uh, position in uh, in France so it was difficult uh, uh, because well, I, I get it I didn't get through uh, out uh, for years uh, this position. So I decided to leave academia. And uh, uh, so in 2019, uh, I, um, I, I decided to integrate uh, the private sectors. And it was difficult too. Uh, uh, I, uh, I did more than 15, uh, 50 jobs applications, but I, uh, I didn't get uh, the job. Uh, I, uh, I wanted to integrate um, uh, private sector as an uh, information specialist. Uh, uh, it was difficult because I think from the employee, employer's point of view, um, uh, I didn't have uh, uh, enough operational experience, professional operational experience, because uh, throughout my careers, I didn't work as librarian or information specialist. So uh, for these employers, I didn't have enough experience, professional experience. Uh, so to get this professional experience or operational experience, I decided to integrate um, uh, uh, private sectors as uh, um, um, or based on internal internship contract. So I followed, I decided to follow a, a, an academic training um, on a digital management project uh, a, as to be a project digital manager. Uh, manager uh, a, um, sorry for my English. <laughs> uh, this helped me uh, to, um, uh, to work, to integrate uh, an, an industry group, uh, a Lanxis, Lanxis, a, a chemical industrial group. Uh, I, uh, uh, my work uh, consists in assisting uh, Lanxis in the digitalization of uh, their uh, uh, production process. Uh, 
uh, this was an, a very valuable experience and it constituted uh, uh, an access point to get my actual job in, uh, at IFI Group. Again, IFI Group, it's an international society that uh, specialized in management innovation, especially in uh, research and development, uh, 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 the management of research and development tax reliefs. Um, so, uh, as uh, Bon, based on this experience uh, in uh, looking for jobs, a stable job, I want to say uh, to, uh, I'd like to say to schoolers and to host institutions, uh, please uh, consider from, uh, from the early beginning of the schooler stay, the opportunities to integrate uh, private sectors, because it took me four years to understand this. Uh, host institution can help uh, uh, schoolers uh, doing so, uh, integrating private sector in, in two ways. Um, uh, first, giving them the method, and second, helping them building their own network. Uh, indeed, most of schoolers, especially in human research, uh, uh, human sciences, do not know how to approach private sectors. So organizing a, a training program uh, uh, will be benefit. Uh, this training program will help schoolers to identify uh, uh, um, uh, societies, companies uh, that are interested in their profile, research profiles, uh, scientific profiles, and to help them to identify precisely uh, the research skills that uh, uh, the soft skills not the research skills, the soft skills that uh, companies uh, are seeking for. And uh, these course programs have to, uh, to, to learn, to, to, to give uh, uh, schoolers uh, 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 the method uh, of how to marketing themselves or how to promote uh, their research experience as a value added for the companies, not as a, not an operational experience uh, like what happened to me. Uh, uh, schooler, host institutions can uh, help schoolers in uh, building networks. Uh, host institution usually can, well, in this way, for, for building network, host institution can organize uh, events uh, as to put uh, researcher at risk in contact with private uh, companies. Uh, university uh, universities uh, uh, in Europe, I think, uh, on all Europe, organize usually uh, a careers fair. Uh, here in France, we, we call it uh, Salon de l'Emploi. And this uh, Salon de l'Emploi, these careers fairs are usually uh, um, conduct to increase the employment of their students. Uh, it's, so it's a good way, it's, a, it's good to encourage uh, researchers uh, to um, to participate at these fairs, uh, as uh, to, uh, to 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 make contact, uh, to to post their CVs, uh, to talk about their experience, uh, it's uh, it was good benefit uh, uh, for me. Uh, and another way to help researchers uh, uh, building their this their uh, own network is to involve them. Uh, uh, in the in research projects that are conducted or uh, uh, or funded by uh, private sectors, uh, in France we have this kind of contracts. We we call it CIFRE. So uh, integrating research uh, researchers at risk in these projects, uh, research projects, it will be benefit. Even there is no direct remuneration for the schoolers. Um, this is. Uh, Two ideas that I, um, uh, I uh, uh, highlight uh, based on my experience and how to, to help uh, research at risk integrating uh, private sectors. Uh, but are, there are uh, lots of other uh, ideas that will be that, uh, maybe uh, presented by uh, Merit uh, based on the uh, report of uh, the Inspireship projects. Thanks. Thank you very much, Swad. Thank you. This was very interesting. And I know that this is a struggle for many scholars on how to uh, approach the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure that we will um, return to these questions uh, when we have the um, when we have the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Swad. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
And by this, I would like to invite uh, Ahmed to, to um, put on his camera and his voice. The floor is yours, Ahmed. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, first of all, let me tell you a few words about myself. I'm um, a film and media scholar, originally from Turkey, and I was part of this uh, group called Academics for Peace uh, in Turkey. And uh, I don't want to get too much into detail because I'm, I guess you are somehow familiar with the situation. Uh, but since the trial of the Academics for Peace began in 2016, uh, it has become very difficult to work uh, inside Turkey and many of our colleagues lost their jobs, tried uh, and, uh, you know, has been um, you know, target of attacks uh, as well. So my journey began in 2018 and in this process I had to sort of uh, benefited from uh, the two host institutions. So I'm going to talk about um, my own experience and what might be the sort of um, sort of best practices um, in this uh, sort of process. Um, so first, um, <clears throat> I had um, worked at the Department of Nordic and Media Studies at University of Agder in Kristiansand, Norway. Uh, and then recently I have moved to uh, Stockholm University's Institute for Turkish Studies. And each has a different, uh, in each case, I have a different kind of experience, but uh, the, uh, the principles are kind of similar. So I, I want to highlight a few things. First, maybe uh, the preparation period, uh, you know, how uh, it sort of began and uh, evolved. Um, I think I was lucky to have a sort of a certain time, at least three, four months in advance to uh, prepare for my, um, you know, uh, transition or, or, or um, journey to the host institute. Uh, and in both cases, I had uh, spoken to uh, department chairs or institute leaders, and they have been very helpful. And so the planning, I think, is very key uh, in this process. Um, in Agda, for example, um, the department chair uh, put me in contact with um, some colleagues from the uh, department and they kindly offered me uh, sort of a guest lecturing uh, in their courses. Uh, so I had already had, you know, a couple of weeks of uh, guest lecturing um, with um, uh, different courses and it really helped me for uh, this transition and, uh, you know, learn the environment and meet the students. Uh, and eventually, uh, after this sort of one uh, term of uh, guest lecturing, uh, I was offered uh, a, a sort of course on my own, uh, which I thought uh, for uh, actually uh, one and a half year. So that was very helpful. And here, uh, this is mainly a research institute. There's not much teaching involved, uh, but I had again, I had the chance of you know, doing some planning. And in this case, I made a um, research and activities plan. We kind of discussed this with our uh, institute leader. And uh, now we are sort of, um, you know, uh, using that plan as a roadmap uh, for my studies. So that was very important. And after the arrival um, stage, uh, I also had sort of, um, you know, enjoyed um, some, <clears throat> um nice uh, practices um again um, i think the meeting new people and networking is very key to our profession and this is not very easy often uh and uh, usually the candidates of um sort of assigned mentors or advisors that, that are very helpful but also i think there might be some other uh platforms uh that might be helpful uh for example at university out there uh, there was kind of a program which sort of encouraged people to host uh, newcomers to the university. Uh, basically, the idea was to, uh, if uh, an, another colleague wants to invite you for dinner, the university canteen provided you uh, with some free food and, you know, soup, etc. And, you know, thanks to this program, I was invited uh, a couple of people's houses and um, sort of, and then they become very good friends and colleagues uh, eventually. Uh, and then, of course, there was another program uh, at, at Christian San, uh, which was initiated by the um, local uh, Chamber of Commerce together with the university, uh, which sort of brought together uh, not just academics, but, um, you know, internationals uh, in the city. And uh, it was, again, a very nice platform for um, networking, learning, sharing experiences. 
uh, and um, it was a monthly sort of meeting uh, sort of throughout the year. And that sort of, again, helped me a lot. Um, another thing I would like to mention um, about uh, this sort of adaptation process is uh, it's important to have this kind of a sense of belonging to a uh, place. Uh, and it sort of depends on the, the person, of course. Uh, as a humanities scholars, I think for me, the most important thing is to 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 you know learn about the culture and uh, so through reading books or film watching films and film scholar uh, that kind of sense of belonging uh, eventually um, sort of appears through that culture so i find it very useful uh to you know and uh, that's something you know you can do it yourself but uh, of course it's always to have some um, guides in that process. We at the university, there was an introduction to culture course, which I like very much. Um, but it's not just perhaps culture. Uh, I also, you know, I think it's important um, to have nature, which we in Scandinavia has have beautiful nature and this sort of um, uh, words, free uh, luft slief. Uh, which I think literally translates as the fresh air life, uh, which is as a city boy for me was uh, something new and which again helped me uh, to have that kind of sense of belonging uh, to the place, uh, which I find important. So I guess, um, you know, activities for, um, you know, um, for, for international faculty or uh, specifically for um, scholars at risk in that sense might be very helpful. And finally, I would like to um, say a few words about the um, career development part. Um, I think Swat's experience are, are, are very important uh, because uh, I guess the, one of the challenges is that um, if you're going to transition or find a job um, in the academic environment, which is highly saturated and competitive, uh, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, so I think uh, transitioning to the private sector is a very wise and welcome addition uh, to the program and idea. And I think the Inspire Europe report has a very um, nice suggestions in, in that sort of direction. Uh, and I find it very important. Uh, but I guess I, I need to mention that it's kind of difficult for the host institutes uh, to arrange all these things. Uh, maybe it's not too realistic. Uh, so I guess we need uh, more um, outside support for such a transition, perhaps labor unions, NGOs, uh, employment offices or local business uh, can be involved. I think the, the mechanisms to involve these institutions uh, is kind of important. Uh, again, I think in Norway, uh, the, the, the labor unions are becoming involved with and, and offering free membership to uh, scholars at risk, and I think that's very important. Um, and one final note, maybe, uh, and uh, sort of, again, uh, we need to, I guess, uh, to sort of um, uh, rethink uh, the academia and find uh, sort of different solidarity networks. And I, and I think in that sense, the experience of our colleagues in, in Germany who establish uh, academy in exile and off university is, is worth mentioning. And these platforms are, um, you know, initiated by uh, Scholar Zetris is forming a new uh, platform for education. And uh, it's sort of very important perhaps uh, to support these kind of institutions. And uh, by this note, I think I, I will conclude uh, my suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Very interesting to hear about your suggestions. And I will, I know that we will return to them when we have the Q&A session. So thank you very much. I will now give the floor to Marit Egner and also the screen. Uh, so Marit, please go ahead. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, so I will share my screen with you and have a presentation. Uh, okay, so um, I will talk about um, 
experiences uh, from the Inspire Europe project because, uh, and also from my personal uh, experience. I am working as the institutional contact person at the University of Oslo for Scholars at Risk, and I'm also uh, coordinating the work package on preparing the work environment at the, in the Inspire Europe project. Uh, I will uh, give you some uh, information from the mapping report of the Inspire Europe project. Uh, where we have looked into, among other things, uh, the support services uh, from the institutions. Um, and um, this first slide that I want to share with you is about the challenges faced by researchers at risk. And we have now heard three different uh, perspectives of researchers at risk. And um, in the slide here is a figure from the uh, mapping report. and. Um, it shows main challenges faced by researchers at risk. And uh, what you see is that um, the main challenges are relating to work. Um, the light blue is very challenging, the dark blue is challenging, and the orange is no problem. And actually, uh, it might be difficult for you to read uh, the small uh, writing here, but uh, these uh, upper ones here is about uh, finding uh, employment employment that match the background, finding employment at all, uh, transition from a fellowship uh, into a new uh, employment, and uh, also the temporary nature of the employment uh, within fellowships, particularly for researchers at risk. And we also see here finding occupation for my spouse and partner. All of these are relating to work, and it means that when we are supposed to support the researchers at risk, uh, in the host institutions, it's important that we take these things into account. Uh, a nice thing is that some other things that we might think that is really uh, challenging uh, are not uh, mentioned as that challenging by the researchers. Of course, there are individual uh, differences here. Uh, so, for example, um, Local language is seen as a challenge by many, but uh, generally getting in contact with your new surroundings, etc., is seen as quite okay by many of the researchers at risk. Um, I have another slide that I want to share with you. This is not a slide actually about researchers at risk, but it's supporting uh, maybe particularly what Soad was talking about, the difficulties uh, in finding academic employment in Europe more generally. This is uh, just an illustration with the um, Norwegian PhD candidates six years after graduation, where do we find them? And uh, you can see that in the higher education sector, uh, you can find around 25% in uh, um, permanent positions and 7%, um, I think, in temporary positions in higher education institutions. Then we have around 20% uh, in research institutes, uh, in private sector, university hospitals, and we also have some in public sector. Very few are unemployed, though. And I think uh, this picture will be similar also for researchers at risk, but of course there are some extra challenges that make it even more difficult, but uh, my point of showing this is that it's important that we look wider than just looking for a permanent position in the higher education sector. Uh, this is another figure from the Inspire Europe mapping report. Uh, it shows support services and activities offered by hosts. And uh, I think from the other speakers in this webinar, you can recognize uh, some of the activities. So we have local language courses, research training, staff development, English language uh, participation projects. I, I think this um, then um, for all uh, international researchers, while the yellow is for researchers at risk particularly, and the dark blue is for uh, refer uh, refer researchers with a refugee background. And um, many of the services are available to any international researcher, and I think this is a good thing because then the researchers at risk will join with others. But there is one particular thing here I think is important, and this is mentoring and buddy systems. 
Uh, here we can see that uh, there is uh, also many mentioning that there are particular systems for researchers at risk. And I think this is an area where we can actually tailor make uh, the support for the particular uh, individual researcher. So it means that if you have a good uh, mentor, academic mentor, um, you can discuss with that um, partner uh, what would be the best things to prioritize because there are so many things that you can do to uh, improve your career uh, prospects, but what are the best things for me to do? Uh, and this can be uh, depending on the background of the researcher, but it can also depend on the um, goals and wishes for the future and also uh, the particular country environment. I could also say that there are several other um, uh, projects than the Inspire Euro project uh, we're looking into different things around integration of researchers at risk and refugees in higher education and the the results from those other projects are um, rather similar they're not um, identical and they're not contrasting uh, but uh, these uh, different projects are complementing each other so um, at the uh, Inspire Europe uh, webpage, you can find under resources uh, one um, list of resources relevant to researchers at risk and host institutions. And there you find uh, links to several projects like the Sucre project, uh, the Bridge project, uh, the CARE project, etc. So uh, if you're interested in reading more, I think you should also uh, look into those resources. Um, I thought I would uh, give you just a few uh, comments from my own background. Um, so uh, some recommendations. One is that a good academic fit between the researcher and the host uh, organization is really important uh, to succeed uh, with the stay. Um, so this means good preparation on the matching. Uh, then I think it's important what was also mentioned by several of the speakers before to think of the whole duration uh, of um, if you have a temporary position or a fellowship it lasts normally one or two years uh, and to think of everything from the uh, recruitment until the next career steps and discuss with the researcher uh, on the way what would be the good steps uh, and what would be the good services and training in order to uh, have a good transition into the next steps. And maybe uh, the goals of the research will change uh, along the way, but still I think to have this discussion all the way is important. Then to have a dedicated academic mentor contact person uh, was mentioned by uh, several speakers. This is uh, very important. And I think uh, in addition to the one who is in the department talking with you about um, the academic opportunities, uh, I think it's also uh, uh, good to know that most institutions will also have some administrative uh, support. So it it can be both, but it should be, uh, at least you should have a good academic uh, contact person. Uh, then I have put in here safe environment uh, for researcher and family. We will not talk very much about this part uh, in this webinar. We have talked about it before and probably we will talk more about it in the next webinar. Uh, early 2021, but of course it's hard to do your work if uh, you don't feel safe or that your family is safe. Uh, it's important to have regular communication and check-ins with the uh, researcher, uh, not to just wait for the researcher to come and ask you things, but to actually uh, actively contact the researcher to, to hear how things are going and discuss what's uh, next uh, activities. And then when it comes to language, I think for some it will be very important, for others it may not. So it depends on if, you've, if the researcher is planning for moving internationally or for example if it's a researcher coming with family and children and um, having the whole um, school and local community contacts and so on, then language is really important. And I think um, we have seen that if the researcher and host institution together are making good uh, opportunities and using the opportunities for integration and 
uh, different uh, uh, professional development, etc., then I think uh, the transition will be smoother to the next steps. And these were my um, my um, uh, recommendations. And maybe we'll come back to some other topics uh, later. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Marit. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. I do agree with all the recommendations you had in your your your, your last slide. That is that is. I, I totally share your experience. So very good. I would like to ask all the panelists to turn on their their cameras since we will now move on to the uh, Q and A session. We had quite a few questions in the uh, in the Q and A, and I will uh, start by asking one of them regarding. Um, the need to be visible and recognized uh, in during a hosting period to get a long-term contract. So the challenge between uh, the need to kind of promote yourself and be visible uh, and at the same time facing um, an at-risk situation. So, and, and maybe want to keep a, a, a low profile out of security reasons. So, um, do you have any comments on uh, on that? What is what what is your advice? What is that relation? I thought that maybe, do you, would you like to say something about that, Ekbal? Um, yeah. Usually, um, the contract for square at risk or refugee scientists they have from the organization who's helping the the um, uh, square at risk one year contract and if your department or institute happy with your work and you are working very well then they can say yes we can host another year this is what i'm understand from my experience and marichi can uh, give her comment on my talk so i think two years is maximum uh, uh, for any square at risk, uh, they have opportunity from organization because the organiz organizations, they need to help another square also. So they are helping with two years to just give uh, a chance for the scholar to looking for a job or um, permanent job. Marit, you can comment on my... Um, I, I think uh, this one plus one year is, of course, uh, a challenge for uh, for many. But uh, when it comes to the security questions, of course, it's both a question of uh, the security of the researcher, him or herself, uh, because some countries can actually um, kind of uh, reach out a little bit too far into your, the host country as well. But it's also a question, I think, about the family and friends at home, because uh, it can be challenging that uh, some regimes are actually punishing other family members if one scholar is uh, reaching too much out. So uh, for the host institution, I think it's important always to discuss with the scholar if it is okay to do promotion activities and the scholar uh, will also need to think through what these things. Thank you very much. And is any other panelists want to comment on, on this question or should we move on? Okay, I don't see any. Do you want to say something, Swad? Uh, no, not especially, but I think uh, for, for um, scholars, uh, promoting him uh, uh, is very important even if there are too many risks, because we have uh, many uh, cat figure, very examples. Uh, uh, we have to consult the schoolers before to say how, what his preference is first, because me, I wasn't really, really threatened in Syria. I was threatened in Iraq, uh, uh, the, my husband uh, family with my husband country. So it's, it's a way, it, well, uh, something depends on the schoolers need. <laughs> Thank you very much, Swad. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to reorganize the squares. Sorry. Uh, yes, the, the, the challenge with the temporary position is 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 at the core of uh, of the uh, these at risk researchers at risk pro related programs, uh, and of course, all of those advice that you have been giving throughout this webinar uh, are to increase the employability and the the success of the, of, of the scholar. Um, so that is a, a, a great help. I would like to move on to to also ask some 
something related to the transition transition to to industry. It's both referring to the to 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 the graph that uh, Marit showed regarding where the where PhD when Norwegian PhD students are uh, after they have gained their PhD, uh, whereas thirty percent only were in higher education institutions. Mm -hmm. And I would also like to mention that um, you have gotten quite a great feedback Swad, regarding your 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 suggestions for mm -hmm. uh, for increasing the transition to to the private sector but um, i would like to ask you and this is a question for all of you uh, but maybe we could start with Swad. if do you see a difference in terms of 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 the scholarly discipline when it comes to transitioning trans transitioning to the um to the private sector um, yeah. yes I think yeah, there there is a, a difference between uh, uh, disciplines, uh, um, scientific discipline more uh, like um, uh, uh, like engineering. Um, uh, 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 they have they can have more opportunities to work in in industries either uh, like engineers or uh, at the uh, research and development uh, department uh, based on their research uh, programs uh, and uh, experience. But in human science, I, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, I have a PhD in library and information science. And uh, uh, I have lots of friends who are in histories and uh, in archeology. span it's, it's more difficult. Uh, to get to integrate uh, and, um, private sectors uh, when you have <laughs> uh, 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 when you are from human science because we don't really as I said know how operational you can be. <laughs> Thank you, Swad. Thank you very much. I would also like to take the opportunity to ask one of my personal questions regarding the, the current situation that we're all facing uh, due to the pandemic and the challenges that we're exposed to. Um, do you have any advice on, on how host organizations can better support researchers at risk within their universities to, to network and to, um, to, to integrate with the research community while everybody's working from home or remotely? Do you have any advice uh, on that? Um. I think in universities, uh, helping researchers at university to build network inside uh, research or outside research, they are they are different. Inside uh, uh, the academia, uh, uh, we have to implicate them more uh, uh, with, the, with with every research project. It, it depends on the uh, uh, laboratory or equip teams uh, of research, because uh, uh, when we choose to get to 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 uh, when a host university is is, is accepted uh, as scholars at least they accepted him to to save him not to save his life so uh, 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 when he came to the university uh, we want him to to be uh, to be uh, um, to have a good experience uh, to produce but uh, but we don't. I, I, in France, I don't. I didn't see that. Uh, um, I, 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 it was difficult for me to integrate a research uh, group. Uh, so, so uh, I think uh, it depends in, in, in inside academia. Uh, it depends on the uh, host institution volunteers. Outside the academia, it's it's also like I said, uh, uh, they uh, universities uh, uh, promote their students, and so they have to promote uh, uh, researchers at risk and to introduce them to industry through fairs, through uh, through events, through evening uh, uh, thematic uh, uh, um, uh, through thematic subjects when when. Uh, organize them to voila well, to. Uh, I think it's it's. Uh, I, I didn't. I don't know if I I I, uh, I reply to your questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Swad. Thank you, Marit. Would you like to say something from the hosting perspective in terms of uh, of networking and the challenges mm -hmm. that we are facing now? Yeah, so of course, uh, the pandemic is uh, influencing many different things. So one thing is uh, travel uh, for uh, researchers at risk to get uh, actually to a host institution and from one host institution to another place if they are moving uh, to a different uh, 
geographical place. And then in the work situation, I think um, there are different ways that this is done at the University of Oslo. We have four uh, scholars at the moment. And I know in some units, they're trying to make it possible for the researcher at risk to uh, come to uh, campus. Uh, but uh, there will still be only very few of the colleagues there, so it doesn't really help that much. Uh, and uh, in other cases, it's uh, to make sure that the researcher at risk is also aware of uh, all the different uh, activities going on um, on different uh, online platforms. Um, and uh, otherwise, uh, maybe Ekbal would uh, say something as well, because uh, I think it's very much the local um, department uh, that will need to uh, do activities to try to include. Yeah, Marit, I think you cover or share what I want to say. But yes, it's also difficult for us as scholar at risk, especially uh, if we are new in the place or institute. We need to meet our colleagues. We, win, uh, we want to uh, all the meetings be personally, physical meetings. So um, it's difficult if I will compare my hosting now with uh, two years in Agdar. It was normal time and now difficult time with COVID-19. So all the meetings uh, digitally, so it was really very nice when you sit with your colleagues. And this is very important to integrate, to uh, understand more about the academic uh, environment, about the culture. Um, so um, it's a really difficult time to just work from home. Hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, it's time to start to wrap up, but I would also like to invite Ahmed if you would like to say a few final words regarding uh, you you being a, a hosting at a quite new institution. This, this, you're in the beginning of your hosting period. Yes, uh, I can maybe also say a few words about your last question. I think it's important and it's probably uh, not just for scholars at risk, but uh, for all the academics. Um, and uh, I guess the only way to, to continue this sort of um, networks uh, platforms in the virtual form. I know it's tiring, I know it's not easy, uh, but I guess we need them uh, even in form, the form of like, uh, we have like regular departmental meetings, um, but it's, it's kind of helpful, you know, sometimes even therapeutic in the sense that, you know, you share your experiences and uh, because we have this, all this pressure of, uh, for, for being productive, I think, but it's, very difficult uh, to be uh, you know, productive at the same time and, and keeping your <laughs> mental health. So I guess we need to um, you know, rely on these virtual meetings for a while. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Thank you. And by this, I would like to thank all the panelists that have participated today. But I would also like to, uh, referring to all the topics that we covered here today, and also to the questions, and also not at least the last uh, thing that uh, Ahmed was mentioned here regarding the mental health uh, of, um, of scholars. Um, I, sorry, I just need to get my notes back. I uh, just wanted to re recommend you to, to uh, go into the Inspire Europe website uh, and also look at the previous webinars on academic publishing and other things that are highlighting almost all the questions that we covered here today. Um, and um, yes, so that is that. Um, I um, And we will also uh, add the um, I would like to recommend a few upcoming events within the project. So you see here in the early spring, we will be launching a webinar um, under the theme of providing psychosocial support for researchers at risk. Um, so that will be published at the uh, uh, Maynooth University uh, and Inspire Europe website. I would also like to, um, to highlight a stakeholder forum that is hosted by the Philipp Schwartz Initiative in Germany. Um, and on April 26th to 27th of next year. So please mark the, these dates in your calendars. Uh, and also I would like to highlight the, the process in 2021 for policy recommendation. These, they say all these presentations that have been showed here today will be, um, will be uh, put on the website together with a number of links to additional resources, um, both regarding scholars at risk, Council for at, at Risk Academics, and also the mapping reports for the Inspire Europe project. 
So by this, um, I would also like to mention that the recording of this seminar will be published on the website probably by Thursday this week. And you, once, they, once the recording is published, you will get an email uh, to advert, advert you about that. Uh, so please have a look at the website uh, of minorituniversity.ie uh, slash SAR Europe slash Inspire Europe for both previous webinars, for uh, additional resources uh, and support for both researchers at risk, but also for hosting institutions. I would also like to remind you to take part in the survey that we mentioned in the beginning of the seminar uh, in order for us to know what you thought about this webinar. I hope to see you soon again. And thank you very much for taking your time today. And thank you again for our eminent panelists and speakers. Thank you. Goodbye.